Welcome! Today we are on some very different front lines. We are at Black Creek Community Farm, which is right next door to our York campus. If these trees weren't here, I would be able to look at campus. Some of you might have recognized that from the buildings behind me of where we are located, um, and others haven't. Maybe some of you haven't even come to campus yet. Um, so today we're going to engage in some very different learning. We normally imagine learning in very specific ways. You might be picturing right now reading something. You might be picturing you sitting in the before times in a classroom with people. That's where we imagine learning to happen. But today we're going to engage in a very different kind of learning, a land-based learning. And we're going to try to do that virtually. We're going to welcome Sweet Grassroots Collective who steward land here at the Black Creek Community Farm to do some learning, to think about the ways our learning has been colonized, the ways that we think about, you know, all the different pieces of our lives um, in very colonized ways. And so really it's an invitation to you to really be open to this new kind of learning or unlearning. And so I just invite you, if you're able to, to maybe take your phone or your laptop, however you're watching this, and to maybe get a bit closer to nature. Um, can you sit outside? Maybe sit next to a plant. Do you have a favorite plant you can sit next to? Just so you can feel a little bit more of, of um, our relations to land and um, other relationships to plants. So welcome, I'm so excited that we get to do this together and I wish you well. I wish you an open heart and an open mind as we engage in this very um, important learning about really what shapes our health um, and how that starts with the land. So welcome. Ani Sego Seguego, welcome to Black Creek Farm and to the Sweet Grassroots Collective Gidiganing or our garden. Digani Chogawe, Young Yat, Mashkigibi Moswin, Indigenous Cause. I said my community worker name is Two Crows. My medicine name, or sorry, my spirit name is Medicine Walker. <laughs> uh, I'm Beaver Clan, I'm making Dodem, Dishkani Zibi, Ne Niawa Onege Gai, and Donjaba. My homelands are at the footwaters of Dishkani Zibi or the Antlered River, also known as the so called Thames. But I have been the last 20 years now in Dando or Toronto uh, on the watershed of the so called Humber River, also known as, again, Niawa Onege Gai, or Kobechanong Zibi, referring to the rapids there. Um, I'm a 2S person walking with the patterns of those medicines and I have been a part of the Sweet Grassroots Collective for I guess two years now and we've had the honor and the privilege of being here at Black Creek Farm uh, setting roots, collecting seeds and medicines and working with community just trying to spread those roots even further um, and to say I'm very honored to be here today with my colleagues to share with you about the work we've been doing. Ani, Bojo, Mujakwa Nadishnakaz, Makwa Dodem, Chirana Nadunjaba. I basically just introduced myself in Ojibwe. My name, my spirit name is Clear Blue Sky. I am Bear Clan and I am from Toronto. Um, I'm here to welcome you to Black Creek Community Farm. I'm also known as the Farm Park Educator here at Black Creek Community Farm. Um, here we do a lot of work. We do a lot of healing through the medicines and through the food that's grown on the land. Um, we practice a lot of food insecurity and food justice here um, on the farm. We're located in the west end of Toronto, uh, 4929 Jane Street, just at Jane and Steele's. Um, we are dedicated to the community of Jane and Finch residents here. And um, yeah, <laughs> miigwech. Bonjour, nin dinishnikaz nebi makwa. Jijib Zagi Gining in Donjaba, Michif Kweanda. My name is Jennifer. My spirit name is Water Bear. I am Metis from Duck Lake, Saskatchewan, and I live in Toronto. And uh, I introduced myself in one of the languages of the traditional territories here of Anishinaabe Moan or Ojibwe. Um, so I am a member of Sweetgrass Roots Collective uh, with Joss and Josh and Emmy Panton. And uh, together we uh, use earthwork, we use storytelling, we use media, uh, we use food, all as ways to engage our community in a process of Indigenous placemaking, of, of feeling 
that we are belonging on the land, uh, that we're creating, that we're uh, accessing our traditional foods and medicines, and that through that we're building relationship with uh, each other, with all of our relatives, our, our plant relatives and human relatives. Um, and, um, and through that, we're changing how uh, we relate to each other and to the land. So we would like to share with you something that we with Sweet Grassroots Collective do pretty much whenever we come together with community, uh, and that's to share the Thanksgiving address or the words before all else. Um, we often understand the Thanksgiving address as that what comes before anything else that's important. So if smudging is important, which it is, then we would do a Thanksgiving address. If the ceremony of earthwork is important, which it is, then we honor the Thanksgiving address. Uh, when we are giving storytelling or teachings, Thanksgiving address is a, is a ceremony in and of itself. Uh, for longhouse people or Onkweome people, and to say, um, I self-identify as a Kichigami no Shikimatsik or as a Great Lakes Métis and I have both Onkweonwe or Longhouse ancestry as well as Nishnabe ancestry, um, Mohawk, Wendat, <laughs> Potawatomi, Mi'kmaq <clears throat> and a mixed bag of European from across the big pond. And Longhouse people whose ancestral ties to these lands are indisputable. For them, the Thanksgiving address is a really important way of addressing grief. And that's by using gratitude, the medicine of gratitude, as a way of shaking grief off so that it doesn't weigh down our minds or our hearts so that we can no longer see the path in front of us or see our relations and how to be thusly in right relations. So without further ado, <laughs> we'll honor the Thanksgiving address. So we'll turn our attention first to the sky world. And so we're thinking of all those relations up there, the sun, the moon, which is filling towards this, this weekend actually, um, wanting to recognize all the star beings and all the planets in our galaxy. So Jupiter and Saturn, Neptune, all those relatives that you can see in your mind's eye and feel in your heart and feel of course in the water in our body as they are pulling us. And then of course, there's all those other planets and stars in the multiverse. So there's a lot of relations out there to recognize but to the sky world, we want to send our greetings and our gratitude. And in the language, in Onkuyomunea, we say, Desenoheradu, we send our greetings and our gratitude. And Jennifer will model to echo so that we can all bring our hearts and our minds together as one in the circle, even the digital circle. Desenoheradu, to the sky world. Yo. Yo, yo, yo. <clears throat> We're going to bring our attentions just a little bit closer to our, to our beings, which is to the atmosphere or the stratosphere. We're going to recognize the four winds that come from the four directions, Wabanong, Jawanong, Ningabianong, Giwedanong, <coughs> east, south, west, north, and also to the thunder beings. So earlier we were talking about how important it is when the rain comes regularly and it comes down gently, and especially when it's charged up with the Animki thunderbird or the lightning, that just the corn or the sisters, actually all, all of those relatives with roots that absorb water really get charged up with that electricity. So we've been very, very blessed to get a lot of good rain. We want to extend our greetings and our gratitude to Yoganolu, the spirit of rain. And again, to those thunder beings, those rumblers, those ones that come with the heavy loaded clouds. And when we are so fortunate, bless us again with the gift of good rain. So to the thunder beings, to Animki, to the four winds, we send our greetings and our gratitude. Desu no Heradu. Yo. Yo. <clears throat> Bring our attention down to the earth or to Akiing in Anishinaabe Moen or Owenjade, Yatanistana Owenjade in Okwiwinea, the earth. Our oldest relative, this planet that with every step prevents us from floating off into outer space and literally grounds us. <clears throat> this rock, and so too for Anishinaabe and Okwiwinea people, we all recognize that the rocks or the minerals are our grandparents. They're the oldest beings on the planet. All those minerals that hold this place together and the other three elements wind water and fire over millennia a really long time wearing the rock down and making <coughs> soil so to the earth firstly and to the other three elements wind water and fire we want to send our greetings and our gratitude desu no heradu yo yo having mentioned soil of course soil is a living thing unlike dirt which is really belly button lint and human detritus that collects in the corners. Soil is alive. And so I want to recognize a special, 
a special community of relatives that are not always acknowledged in the Thanksgiving address. And those are the microorganisms. They're invisible, but everywhere. And they really are the first form of life. In fact, the first form of life was a mushroom or a fungi. <laughs> and, and those beings make it possible for us to digest, make it possible for us to build our immune systems. They are floating in the air. They are on every surface. They are in the leaves, all over the roots. And without microorganisms, there would be no plants. Without plants, no animals. So to the microorganisms, invisible, wondrous beings, we send our greetings and our gratitude. They send no hiradu. Yo. Yo. Oh, some good ones in there. <laughs> so there I recognized uh, the next relations for us to call in, to recognize and acknowledge, which is the plant world. Such a tremendous and generous community of relations for us. So standing here amongst uh, Johequa, our sustenance, our mandamin, our oneste corn, our osejeda, our miskodisha bec beans, our Onosala goa or Okosaman squash. Those are our food relatives who we could be sustained by. Just those three alone sustained our peoples with a full spectrum nutritious diet. But of course, on this farm, there are so many different relatives from, of course, the apple trees that came across the big pond to so many medicines growing wild in the lawn and growing all about here, keeping the pollinators happy, naming the next family to all the food relatives, to all the medicine relatives, to the trees, the great plants that shelter us and of course provide us with materials to clothe ourselves. They have given us almost everything that we have always needed. It's an incredibly generous family of relations. I'm just gonna take a moment for us all in our mind's eye and in our hearts to just see and feel on all the plants that are sustaining you, have sustained you even since you woke up today. To this beautiful community, to the plant world, we send our greetings and our gratitude. De seno heradu. Yo. Yo, 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 yo! <clears throat> the, next, the next circle of relations, having recognized, of course, the insects, is animals. So there's a few different tangents in the animal world, but the first one we'll speak to is the little ones. The winged ones, the multi-legged ones, the ones with mandibles and stingers. They spread seeds, they spread pollen. They are inseparable from the web of life. Every single one of them is needed, and I take the occasion to destigmatize the pests that are referred to as bugs. Er, again, every single insect is needed. Spiders, worms, all the ones that get called creepy crawly, crawlies who actually break up the soil and make it possible for microorganisms to convert them into water-soluble nutrients for plants. Um, the wasps, the bees. The bees, you know, they've been given some new glory but of course they're not the only pollinators that need to be here the wasps the yellow jackets those stinging ones have really important work moths not just the monarchs every single butterfly is needed so to all the insects in all their wonder and glory we send our greetings and our gratitude they send the heradu yo yo wanting to recognize the winged ones the ones who let us know when a storm is coming in they're riding on it and thinking about Migaze and all the medicines that we have associated with or we've connected with in the feather, how it helps us to connect to our truth and of course helps us to connect to our own voice and how wind moves through us. Uh, the winged ones also let us know about the health and the quality of the air because when they disappear we know there's something going on. They also gift us with their song. So every morning and every night we get to enjoy that and that encourages us in our own expression of our song. And so to the winged ones, we send our greetings and our gratitude. They send no heradu. Yo. Yo. I'm thinking about the finned ones, the water world ones, the webbed footed ones, like the ones of the air. They teach us about the currents and the flow of the waters. They let us know by the health of the water, what the health of the waters is through their existence in the waters. So I'm recognizing in saying that how many relatives actually are no longer in the woodlands, the wetlands, or even in the air because the environment is no longer hospitable to their existence. And I carry that with some grief as we have experienced numerous ecocides on these lands. To the water world ones, I want to recognize <clears throat> that they actually clean the water through their bodies. And that's very generous of them to do. No doubt they also gift us with innumerable, innumerable medicines. I'm thinking about my own beaver clan rel relation, which is a relative that beyond what it needs for its own survival, through its water work, 
actually provides hydrological healing to the land. That's just one example. Obviously, I have a bias towards that one. Uh, Mick, <clears throat> I want to also make a, a segue here for the world bridgers. So wherein Amik is both a water creature and an earth creature, thinking too about Mang Loon, who is both a winged one, so one of the sky, as well as a diver. Those ones like us as Métis people or Ashkemetzik people who have a foot in more than one boat, and I'm making reference to the two-row wampum here, that for me I have a foot in the canoe and I have a foot in the tall ship, and that is a very challenging responsibility to bridge across worlds. So those relatives, again, such as beaver, teach us about the ecotones. They teach us about what it is to be between what is fully a water space and what is fully a terrestrial dry land. That wetland space, often referred to as a wasteland, but is actually the most bio-rich ecosystem. Just wanting to restory that. <clears throat> so to the world bridgers, I'm making a segue here. I'm going to come back to the water world once. So the world bridgers, we want to send a special little desu no heraru, desu no heraru yo. to the world bridgers. Yo, 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 yo. Coming back to the water world ones, uh, for all, all the relations you can think of from eel to salmon <clears throat> to even those little crayfish, all those water world ones. We're just going to take a moment because often we, we don't make enough time and space to think about them because they're not walking around with us. So it's an opportunity to allow ourselves to immerse into the water spaces and to really connect to our own water and to our feelings, our crying ceremonies, etc. So to the water world ones. We send our greetings and our gratitude. Desu no heradu. Yo. Yo. Now we're moving towards the four-legged ones. I love to say from moose to mouse. <clears throat> of course, many people have at home their domesticated animals, dogs and cats and hamsters and the like. Those are important relations that we have close to us where we can connect to their medicines because they live in our homes and in our families. Often when I'm talking with kiddos about relations or right relations, it's an easy peace for them to grasp that those relatives are their relatives because they're part of their family. You care for your dog as part of your family as you might a sibling or even a chosen family member, your friends, etc. And so it's only a little stretch to think then of corn who has sustained us in as much as any dog has as a relative. And what does it mean then to think about corn or to think about the maple tree as a relative or to think about the river or a stone or even rain as a relative? It's a paradigmatic shift, actually, to, to open our hearts and our minds to these relationships. <clears throat> Wanting to think about the wild ones in particular, who because of stigma and stereotype have been very much pushed away. I'm thinking about Mayang and Wolf and Makwa Bear, and I'm looking to my uh, Makwa Niji over here and feeling on how we story them and they're majestic, and yet their own habitats have been which is so fragmented and, and they walk in the shadows in order to survive. And it is about their wildness that I mention them because there's something about rewilding that is also a part of the work that we're doing here because we are inseparable from the wilds ourselves as much as we like to get ourselves in a box and domesticate ourselves. <laughs> the wildness is also the play, is also how we connect to the medicines actually is by allowing ourselves to believe and feel that they have spirit that we can connect to or sense on. Um, so to all the four-legged ones, again, taking a moment here, recognizing that they have also gifted us so much from food to medicine to bundle items, etc. <clears throat> to the four-legged ones, we send our greetings and our gratitude. Desu no heradu. Yo. Yo. Last but not least, <laughs> and as we recognize in our creation stories, and this connects us to our original instructions, both as Onkyoen and Anishinaabeg peoples, the two-legged animals and that's we human people. So we're the youngest of all the relatives. We have learned everything and we receive everything from all those other relations, um, which tells us, one, that they, they don't need us, actually. We need them. We've always needed them and we will always need them. We've been offered a really, really important opportunity, a blessing since the first Nishnabig person touched down so gently on the earth, coming, descending from the eight fires of creation. <clears throat> Through ceremony, we can connect to all these relations. I don't need to speak the language of corn or even the language of dog to connect to them. When I allow myself to be fully present 
which is not an easy thing to do today. I can feel my spirit connect to these relations and through our ceremony, when we feel safe enough and comfortable enough to ascend, to sink into our ceremony, we connect to all these relations on this dimension. And of course, I think about the Western direction across my, from us here and I think on the spirit portal or the gateway there to our ancestors, to our helpers and our guides who have been walking with us since we crossed from the threshold of our mother's waters into this terrestrial plane. Uh, and to know that they're there, not just that hunch, but that that intuition is our helper, is preventing us from walking off a cliff, proverbially and literally. Um, just wanted to make that connection. To be a two-legged one is to walk with ceremony, to walk in spirit. So I want to recognize in a form of land acknowledgement uh, the inherited traditional peoples of these lands. So recognizing uh, Wendat peoples and their descendants, the Wyandot and the Wendage, wanting to recognize all the Onkwewe people who actually have been quite literally erased from these lands, Petun, Erie, Tobacco, neutral peoples, and of course the Haudenosaunee are referred to as the Six Nations, the Ganyangahaga, Mohawk, Seneca, Oneida, Onondaga, Tuscarora, Cayu, and so many Anishinaabeg peoples that I want to recognize. The Algonquin peoples, the Three League Fire, the Ojibwe, Odawa, the Parotomi, the Nehea, the Chippewa, the Delaware Lenape, the Soto, Blackfoot, Fox, there's so many more that I could mention, of course, and the Wabanaki Confederacy peoples who came down the St. Lawrence from the East Coast as well, many more nations of peoples. And to, by that, I want to turn our attention to the dish with one spoon, which was, and I carry this teaching from the faith keepers at Six Nations, but not exclusively, that the dish with one spoon which we refer to on these lands, which uh, all those within the Great Lakes Basin are subject to was an agreement between 50 plus nations, 50 plus nations. So that's not just one nation of people. That's not just the Mississaugas. And having said that, the Mississaugas were the treaty partners in the Toronto Purchase. So I want to honor that they were part of that process. They endured that process and they are the stewards of our treaty relationships with the city of Toronto. Uh, but just to recognize that the nation to nation relationships that this land has held because of the sheer diversity of foods and medicines that the Great Lakes Basins has offered, uh, represented here by the circle or the dish. The dish is the earth and it has everything we need, again, to sustain us. That one spoon is meant to represent that we are all peaceably agreeing to share what is here to harvest. And that's not just food and medicine, it's also literally the spirit connection to these lands as this is a power place. Largest body of fresh water. At one time though, very much only a sliver of what the great wetlands used to be and of course the great woodlands where a squirrel could go from the eastern shore of Lake Ontario all the way to the Detroit River without ever having to set foot on the ground. Those woodlands are gone. We live in a ghost land now and so we, the dish with one spoon is actually mostly piled high with death dust <laughs> to say that is part of uh, an indigenous land acknowledgement that I have been offered by my faith keepers and my elders to convey because to be an earth worker is also to be a grief worker. Uh, and we'll talk more about that, but miigwech for honoring the Thanksgiving address and for honoring the Two-Spirit people, our last day sinoheradu, to the two-legged ones, we send our greetings and our gratitude. De sinoheradu! Yo! Yo! Uh, so mi miigwech, Joss, for your teachings around the Thanksgiving address. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to do a storytelling circle. And um, to the audience, I invite you to um, think about your own stories, your own personal relationships that you have to all of the different relatives that Joss was uh, telling us about. Um, storytelling is a powerful way to connect to each other, to connect to the land, and to, to remember our histories and who we are. Uh, we can do that through traditional stories, and we can do that also through personal narratives. Uh, and so that's what we're going to do right now, is we're going to just do a short storytelling exercise to model what it's like to find those connections between this bigger teaching to our own personal lives, to remind ourselves that we have connections to all of those things that Joss talked about already, um, and that it's, it is about honoring those relationships, and that those come from small moments in our days, from our childhood, from just yesterday, um, and so I'm going to give these four prompts. I'll give one to each of the people uh, in our storytelling circle. So tell me a story about um, a relationship you have to an animal. Tell me a story about 
a connection you had uh, to the elements. Uh, tell me a story about a relationship to plants or to insects. Uh, and just a, a reminder with stories, um, the more specific we are about our story, the more that it's about our own lives or about our own memories. I remember the day this happened, the more universal it becomes, the more people are able to connect. We connect in stories through emotion because I might not have had the same experience as you, but I have had the same emotions as you. So if you experienced joy, I can feel that joy from my heart to yours. If you experience grief, I know what loss is. I know how it impacts us. I can feel that. Um, and so that's where the power of storytelling is, is that mirroring of emotion. And that's what helps us be more open to understanding new issues. It helps us be open to making changes in our lives uh, because of that emotion and because of that connection. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to do um, a speed storytelling circle. So these are not uh, the, you know, did you know the Thanksgiving address can last four days? So if you thought, wow, that was a really long storytelling about that Thanksgiving address, you can think to yourself, that was, that was nothing. So um, we're going to do the opposite right now. We're going to tell our stories in a couple of minutes each, just as a way to sort of understand that we've all got these stories in us. Okay, so Jessica, can you tell me a story about the elements? Hmm, okay. Um, so I'm thinking about a day that um, in the summertime, um, when the sky sort of opened up and we got a huge downpour and my two little kids said can we please go out and run in the rain and my first instinct was to say no because I thought about all the wet clothes and the laundry I'd have to do and then our basement is slippy when they come back in um, <laughs> but I said risk. yes let's do it <laughs> yeah risk um, and they ran outside and they were just so full of joy we were outside in the rain and it just felt so nourishing and just to see how joyful they were and how um, you know I sort of put down those pieces that were worrying about other things and just let them really be joyful mm -hmm. in the rain so that um, yeah that's a, a beautiful memory of being grateful for that mm -hmm. um, that element mm -hmm. thank you miigwech yeah. Jessica it was beautiful that reminds me of my childhood too because mm -hmm. I grew up uh, in a sort of semi-arid area in BC and so it didn't rain a lot but when it did every single time my brother would take me outside and we'd jump in the puddles and yeah I love that thank you so much yeah thanks yeah she said I'm thinking about rain dancing in the corn <laughs> bring it down yeah. bring it down <laughs> um Joss can you tell me a story about an animal yeah totally um I'm feeling on about a month ago, I was, yeah, on this land that is sort of the crossways between the Kawartha's, the so-called Kawartha Lake region, and the Muskoka region, uh, in a, a stretch where that really old granite, like the oldest outward-facing rock is, mm -hmm. very twinkly, it's so powerful. Um, I have an elder from Six Nations who was needing some support with some health stuff, so I had gone up or down or whichever direction. <laughs> Uh, to just to support that and after having been in and around a hospital for six or seven hours I really just needed to you know wind down and so knowing that there's a beaver pond down the hill uh, headed down there at sunset because that's the time to see them and I, as I've already acknowledged it's my clan it's the beaver so mm -hmm. I, uh, I have an eye for beavers and I love to spot them on the land wherever possible because of course they used to be all over the place and were a you know, critical part of the fur trade, you know, needed to be turned into hats apparently. And, <laughs> and then they were nearly ex like exterminated mm -hmm. from the land or nearly, I guess, extinct from the land, but now they are exterminated. Like people treat them as pests and shoot them, trap them, try to get rid of them. Uh, they just don't want to support them in their water work. So anyways, to see a beaver pond is a really special thing. So they have this huge lodge, again, probably generations of beavers in there. Uh, and I could see their kind of their trails in the water through the duckweed and through uh, the aquatic vegetation. And this, this dam that is raising the water at least four feet and it's wrapping all around the pond. So much work that they've done. Uh, and to say, in all those ways I could see the beavers, but I didn't see 
a beaver, even though I really wanted to see a beaver. So this is kind of a story about actually the invisibility of this relative. But I had been and was nearly finished reading this book, which is called A Short History of the Blockade <laughs> by <laughs> this Nishnabi Kwe uh, Lian Berasamosage Simpson, who talks about land as pedagogy among the things, which in this, this book, The Short History of the Blockade, she's talking about how blockades as land defense are very similar mm -hmm. to beaver dams and that uh, land defenders like Beaver, community workers, they're doing healing and transformative work, transformational work that's, that extends well beyond their immediate experience and even their family or their kin, that they're do work, doing work for all different kinds of relatives and generations. So what I especially was feeling on when I was there by that, by that Beaver Pond was this teaching that she gives in that, in that writing, which is that how the blockade, on that side you have a military presence and it's very like settler colonial and it's very institutional and fairly violent, fair to say. And on this side is like a paradigm shift. It's like an entirely different world going on that, that like e the ecosystem looks different and feels different. It's much more f focused on healing and transformative justice and self-governance and a different kind of um, economy of exchange and barter in terms of medicine work and what have you. Uh, and it's like worlding a whole new future. Mm -hmm. And that the beaver dam is like that too. On that side is what the farmers or the hydro line managers or those people with their settler colonial ideas are like, we want it to look like mowed grass. <laughs> we want glyphosate on there, roundup ready lawn, okay? And on this side of the dam is, is it's a whole other world mm -hmm. full of uh, biodiversity and lots of different relations and anyways so that's what I was feeling on that's what I was chewing on <laughs> you got that had to get twice. it in there had twice. to get it in there it's a good one <laughs> <laughs> me question Yo. Marcy Josh yes um can you tell me a story about a plant relative Okay, so um, growing up as a kid, um, First Nations school here in Toronto, I always used to like to pull the grass off the ground, right? Sit on the grass because we'd all sit in a circle, have a circle, and uh, introduce ourselves and all that. So I was pulling the grass, and our elder teacher was uh, basically looking at me, and she said, hey, stop that. Did you put tobacco down? And I said, no, why? Why do you need to put tobacco down? And she said, well, basically, you're taking some from Mother Earth without thanking her or giving her thanks for it. You're not putting your offering down. And I didn't know that as a kid because I was only four years old, right? So I'm learning about my own tradition, my own culture. And through that teaching and that lesson I learned was uh, that you need to be humble on anything you take from Mother Earth. Yeah. Um, anything you, uh, advice you may take from somebody, you know, it's always good to just um, give back a thanks and a tobacco tie or a piece of a cigarette if you don't have a tobacco tie on you, you know. Um, and yeah, so basically that, that teaching there, that, uh, that always took me all my life, um, just to be humble with anything around you in general in life, that um, it's always good to give thanks. And in our culture, how we give thanks is by tobacco or a piece of cigarette, just to um, acknowledge that. So yeah, just wanted to mm -hmm. share that little bit of story with you guys. Yeah. So much, Josh. Uh -huh. um, okay, so I'm gonna tell a story about an insect. Um, and that insect is the black fly. Um, Joss was talking about how some animals and some relatives are considered pests. And I think I grew up for sure believing the black fly was a pest. And uh, when I was in university, all the way through every sum summer, I would go tree planting out west. So I'm from British Columbia, I would go back there, I would um, plant trees all summer. Um, and there would be a period of time when the black flies were so intense. And so I'd wear a long button up shirt and I would wear my long pants and I would be like all covered up with my hat. Uh, and they still, they still find their way to you. So in particular, I remember one that made its way into the back of my ear. And uh, by the end of the day, it was just all, you know, it was a big bloody mess. Uh, but not only that, it, it uh, you know, my body reacted to it, so it really like flared up, and I had this giant lump on my, on my head. Um, that was just this reminder of that relative <laughs> for quite a few days. Um, but the the reason why I think of the black fly now is that just a couple of weeks ago, I took my son to a culture camp, and it was up in wild blueberry territory, and um, and. 
she taught me that the black flies are the pollinators of the wild blueberries and it makes perfect sense because it's exactly the same territory uh it, but i say it like that because it had never occurred to me <laughs> like i'm in my 40s now and i just hadn't thought this little black fly pollinates things and just like joss was saying that we we often think of just just the just the honeybee as being the uh, pollinator out there when in fact there's so many there are so many pollinators um, and so that really helped me think okay well sometimes our relatives bug us uh, but they also have gifts for us and so that blueberry is the gift from the black fly and um, so I'm it really helps me change my relationship <laughs> to that black fly <laughs> uh, and uh, thank you all for your stories um, oh. All of those are just reminders to us about how we do have relationship with the, all of these relatives, that it's in our day-to-day -day lives that we build those relationships. Um, and that if we're feeling disconnected, it's as simple as going outside in a rainstorm, putting Sema down, finding those relationships um, wherever they are around us. Uh, and that that's where we build that gratitude and that's where we change that relationship that we're not here to sort of take over as human relatives to be the ones but that that we need to always be connected to all of those relatives to have a healthy healthy world for us and for all of them mm -hmm. so uh, miigwech marci uh, thank you for all of your stories um, and we'll close our storytelling circle So here we are again at the eastern direction of the medicine wheel. Uh, we opened here and I just wanted to story in uh, the medicine wheel itself. So as you can see, well you can't see where the sun has come up, but I assure you that the sun came up uh, straight ahead there in the eastern direction. And so we, this is one of a few medicine wheel gardens that I've created uh, with community. The idea being that there are always at least four channels open or spokes sometimes they're referred to of course there's a circle and this is a tiny medicine wheel in the grand scheme of medicine wheels um, today contemporarily people often think of the medicine wheel as that circle with the four colors split in four red yellow white and black different orientations depending on which nation is is uh, connected to that medicine wheel I definitely want to recognize Neha Cree people for their amazing work historically with medicine wheels um, the medicine wheel was a landscape. It was an earthwork on the land. So this is uh, honoring that tradition. And of course, Nishnabe and Onkwe people were also mound builders, which is to say collected stones, brought together stones and earth, mounded them up for a number of different purposes. In some cases to create giant thunderbirds, in some cases to create giant serpents. Uh, in this case, uh, this is again, just a tiny gesture, a tiny nod toward the medicine wheel, which is a spiritual portal. And it's been my experience that as we create that circle and we open up the four directions, you can feel the energy start to spiral. Uh, I'm going to honor my own way, own way ancestries uh, rather than going clockwise as the Anishinaabe people do. And of course, I'm a world bridger in this way too, or a battleground of colonization. But I'm going to go counterclockwise as the Longhouse people would and introduce you to this medicine wheel. So as we would with a sacred fire, we always enter the eastern direction. Our teachings about the eastern direction is as the, the day begins in the East, uh, we, we hold the medicines of birth and, and new relationships and infancy, spring, so all that emergent energy. So when we're coming into a medicine well for the first time, same idea, we wanna come into it because it's a new relationship. So I'm welcoming you into this medicine wheel. Um, we're gonna actually head in this direction towards the North. Just give you a chance to look and see what we're growing here. So. <coughs> Probably most of you have heard of the Three Sisters, which is an English translation of Johekwa in Onkwe or again, the language of the Longhouse people, uh, also referred to as Iroquoian. Um, Johekwa actually more directly transliterates to our sustenance. Uh, and the Three Sisters that we know today, which is corn or oneste in Onkwe Omenea, or mandamen, beans, uh, osehera, or miskodishibik, and squash. So we've got some beans down here. Squash didn't do so good in this quadrant for whatever reason. They, they're sovereign, so they do what they want to do. Um, again, Okosaman or Ononsalat Goa. The three sisters, though we know them growing in a mound, and this is a, a perfect example of, of synchronicity or symbiosis or what gets called companionship, planting, they work together in a, an incredibly 
brilliant way. So Corin is recognized as the first sister comes up and as our eldest siblings often do, they're really, they're really strong. They're really supportive. They offer a lot of structure. So being that second sister, when she comes in, she looks up at her tall growing sister. And of course, Bean is a vine. Bean needs something to climb on. So she's so appreciative. Bean is so appreciative to have that structure to climb on. She does this really cool magical thing where from her roots, she exudes an enzyme that attracts microorganisms. So you recall in the Thanksgiving address, I was recognizing those invisible but everywhere little creatures that make literally all life possible. Bean and all the legume family attract microorganisms. Uh, they're often referred to as nitrogen fixers. The bean themselves don't fix nitrogen. It's the microorganisms that do that, but they attract the microorganisms. And that shows something about the sentient wisdom of plants, that a, a plant can do that from its roots in the rhizosphere, attract those microorganisms that start to conglomerate all around the roots, and we can start to see these little nodes. They actually take gas from the air, in this case nitrogen gas, and turn it into nitrates, which then the plants can uptake, and that helps them all grow better. So we don't need miracle grow when you got bean in a mound. Squash, that third sister, we can look to in the other direction. In the southern direction, we've got uh, what is called the Gete Okosamon, which is a really old squash in Anishinaabe Moen, um, found in a clay vessel at White Earth First Nation, south of the medicine line. Um, this woman, Winona Leduc, check her out, she's badass. She, fo she found these, these seeds or rematriated these seeds back to the people. When they cracked that clay vessel open and carbon dated the seeds, they were over 800 years old. And it's a very unique kind of squash. I got, received some of those seeds as a seed keeper from a grower at Wikwemekong on Manitoulin Island or Mani um, And that squash, that squash sister, she comes out, she sees bean and corn doing their thing, working together so well. She says, you know, as also a vine, instead of going up, I'm gonna vine low. I'm gonna vine around the mound and I'm gonna grow these big leaves, kind of like umbrellas. And I'm gonna shade the soil from the, the heat and from the wind to keep that moisture, that water in the soil. Cause of course they need that, they all need that. Older varieties of squash, including the Gete Okosamon, are really prickly. And that also acted as a natural defense against certain critters that really wanna feast on these relatives. So you can see how they work in this perfect relationship to grow together. But what I want to restore is that the three sisters, or Johequa, never actually grew just as three relatives in the biosphere. In an ecosystem, biodiversity is really critical. So there's actually various stories, depending on which nation of people are talking about the sisters. They grew in ecologies of many sisters. Some would say five, some would say seven, some would say 21, some would say 52. Some would say, actually, it's an infinite amount of possibilities given where you're growing in what environment. So we'll talk to you about more of those sisters, but I just want to uh, introduce or recognize this uh, wild growing odamin or strawberry. Um, like the wild blueberries we were talking about or the Jennifer was storing in, they're little berries. They're very tiny, but they are packed with so much more flavor than those ginormous strawberries spliced with fish that you buy in the grocery store. Um, this strawberry is recognized as medicine. And in fact, all these foods and all food should be seen as medicine. When we're eating nutritious food that's grown in a healthy and ecological way, it helps us to maintain good health, which means rather than having a reactionary process or a methodology for addressing dis-ease or dishealth, that we try to maintain good health by consuming medicinal teas and healthy foods that are, we know are healthy because they're not only not harming the land, they're actually helping to regenerate the soil in that kind of regenerative reciprocity. So uh, Odemin, strawberry is recognized as a heart medicine. We have a teaching that because it's shaped like a heart, it, that tells us about that heart medicine, but Western science too has shown that it has medicine that helps with blood circulation. And there is something about the sweetness of strawberry, the leader of all the berries, uh, that that reminds us about the sweetness of life or the good life and so in that way is an emotional healer and it, rather than you know reaching for sugar that is for, especially for indigenous people really hard for us to digest and hence our exorbitant rates of diabetes uh, natural sugars give us a more balanced um, you know feeling that we could call a high that natural high I'm gonna enjoy their strawberry so another sister in the ecology of sisters is strawberries. So that's why we have a mound of strawberries in each direction. I'll turn your attention to this outer mound here where we have some semma, which Josh was talking about. And of course, I'm also carrying some semma. This is some of the dried tobacco from last year's harvest. Um, a semma is what we call it in Ashnabe Moen or Oyengwa Onwe and Onkwe Onwe Nea. 
um, our first sacred medicine. And because we're coming from the Eastern direction and I want to recognize that medicine because we also put tobacco and we'll learn more about that in the Eastern direction because it was our, as, as our first medicine and as certainly the leader of the medicines, um, it's really important to have it here. And this particular tobacco is a ceremonial tobacco, a yellow flowering tobacco. Like the Gete Okosum on the squash, these seeds that were given to me by my elder Dave Gerald were said to be in his Parwatomi family uh, for 800 plus years. So they're a very old variety, not anything like the kind of tobacco that's grown for manufacturing cigarettes. A very different kind of tobacco indeed. We also have some Wingosh sweetgrass and some raspberries, all sisters again in the ecosystem of sisters that we're trying to restore here. And restoring is a concept that plays on both restoration or ecological restoration, but also of course speaks to how important our oral traditions or storytelling is for us to reclaim our heritage, to reclaim our culture, uh, especially in the face of so many colonial practices that have barred us from speaking, even in English about our culture. Um, it's a very specifically two-spirit teaching that I received from a Cherokee community member south of the medicine line, which is a way to invite relatives that have been excluded from the circle back into the circle. And that includes actually very much all of these non-human or other than or more than human relatives because in a decolonial process, trying to recognize that these are our relatives. Human people have been walking with corn for hundreds of thousands of years and it is the number one food source on the planet, number one crop. And yet the genetic diversity of the corn that is grown on the planet comes from less than 1% of genetic diversity, which actually is a very, very vulnerable food system. So when Josh talked about food insecurity and food justice, we actually are looking at a really important part of worlding a new future, a future where we're not reliant on oligopolies who are wielding a tremendous amount of power to control our food system, prevent us from keeping seeds, but more importantly than that, choosing what we're, what we're eating. And in the context of corn, again, when you have so little genetic diversity, we become so reliant on petrochemicals. So the corn that's being grown all over the planet is, is not chosen because it's nutritious for us. It's not chosen because it's easier to grow. It's primarily chosen for two reasons. It can handle thousands of chemicals being on it and it can be transported well. <clears throat> so that has nothing to do with the environment and it has nothing to do with our bodies. So the externalized cost of those toxins in the soil of thousands of chemicals that externalization in the air and the water, and it flows through our bodies because of course we breathe and we drink, we are water and air. Uh, to say the traditional or what we call tribal seeds of indigenous peoples for many generations now mostly have been held in various institutions. In this case, this Parwatomi corn that I received uh, is referred to as the Zizhak corn or the crane corn, it comes from Parwatomi people of Michigan, uh, connected to my own Parwatomi family. Uh, their seed was held at uh, Michigan State University for decades. So the people engaged in a campaign to repatriate the seeds, which means giving the seeds back to the people. But to bring the seeds back to the land, which we call rematriation, is another thing because, of course, the colonial process was to take the people who were here and put them over there. Take those people, put them over there. Take those people, put them over there. So in order to maintain your culture and your customs as tied to the land, because of course all culture is inseparable from the land, our language, our ceremonies, everything is inseparable from the land. Uh, it's a way of breaking the connection. So for these seeds that were held in Michigan, they were also grown here because of course these are Potawatomi lands as well. I think on the Potawatomi peoples of the Wasagama or Georgian Bay area. Um, and they respond to the land they come from. You could try and grow these in Nevada, they won't grow. They won't. <laughs> you could try though. Uh, especially these rarer varieties that have been held for so many years sitting, you know, just literally in seed banks, they haven't been adapting to climate change. So it's really, really, really important for us to be growing these out so that we can have the genetic diversity for the future. Again, thinking on any number of, of speakers or thinkers about food security, really thinking about Vandana Shiva at this moment, who talks about the importance of reclaiming our seeds and that growers, people who get called farmers or gardeners or what have you, have little to no power today because agribusiness decides what we're gonna grow. When you get your seeds, you get a kit full of chemicals. Uh, it's very disempowering, but on a global scale, again, if more than 50% of the people on the planet are eating corn, 
and it's such a, a valuable but vulnerable crop, we can see that the, the, the reality of food insecurity or food scarcity as it relates to corn is, is impending, especially with the impacts of climate change. So this particular variety comes in all different colors and historically people have referred to this corn in a number of different ways, but we just again call it the Zizhak corn. The beans that come from my Mohawk grandmother come through my family are black turtle beans and I already named that squash. Um, for me, it's really important to talk about the story of the seeds, to restory them, because of course, without the stories, we lose something really valuable about the biocultural knowledge of these relations. And when I speak to biocultural knowledge, what comes with it is songs, what comes with it is dances. And you know, I, when I was talking about the rain dance, I was serious about that. Different communities have different kinds of ways of honoring the thunder beings all over the land. And that is 100% an indigenous practice to honor the rain. Um, I would actually go so far as to say, when we're talking about writing relations, in the same way that insects are referred to as bugs and thusly stigmatized, the rain has also been stigmatized. People will say, rain, rain, go away. Don't rain on my picnic. And there's actually energy in that. There's an energy in that. And we need the rain to come more often and more gently. We need to love on the rain uh, because otherwise what we've been experiencing is great periods of drought. And when the rain comes down, it comes down fast and furious. And because there's so much hardscape, which is to say asphalt, concrete, etc., the rain just runs off into storm water. It, it, it doesn't have the opportunity to really permeate into the soil. So I, you know, I really invite you actually to, and I imagine, and you can laugh with me on this, that in saying that, writing relations with the rain, that you got a little colonial squirm going on and, and have empathy with yourself because it's a real thing. We've all been colonized. We've all been institutionalized in any number of ways. The educational system is a pipeline of colonization or settler colonial thought. And uh, we are at an unprecedented time because of the impacts of climate change, but also because of the COVID pandemic, which has in many ways asked us to step out of our boxes, our settler colonial boxes, and reconnect with the natural world because that was a safe space where we could be. If there's a breeze, we could, we could be out on the land. I've heard over and over again in the past two growing seasons how people are reconnecting. They're remembering that actually all these relations are out here for us. Um, a really important teaching that I'll convey, no other relative will judge you except for humans. Only humans have the capacity to judge. So for anyone who has struggled with marginality or vulnerabilization because of your social location, and especially obviously if that intersects with your, your class access, racialization, et cetera, different abilities and what have you, you'll never be judged by corn. You'll never be judged by the rain. You'll never be judged by a river or a rock or a tree. So when people tease, oh, about tree hugging or what have you, um, just think about when you were a child, if you were ever drawn to stones. I use this example often. I'm sure every one of us here have picked up a stone once before. In the same way of decolonizing relationship to rain and to insects, try to imagine that the stone actually chose you, that the stone actually called your attention to it because it saw that you needed that medicine. And of course, we do know in Western science that stones have properties, they have energies to them, and they do help us, uh, not just as something to fiddle with in our hands, but they actually have medicines for us, and that is long-standing indigenous knowledge, to walk with our grandparents, aka the stones, to find grounding and to find a number of sources of inspiration. So I, I bring this up, this piece about uh, colonial thought and the colonized squirm, because <clears throat> when I am saying over and over again that these are our relatives, I want, I want to create some space to decolonize, decolonize that these are not just things that we own, or that we possess, we actually don't own, we don't even own the land. But in the context of the mindset of owning the land, if it's true that the land can be owned by people, then not a single relative is free, least of all human people, because any individual proprietor can make whatever decision they want. Uh, but I, I believe in a future and a worlding of a future that's very different than that. Um, I'm thinking about specifically at this moment, when I'm sitting in this space full of sisters and I'm coming to the center here, which may or may not have been apparent, we've just come through the northern direction um, where we honor our elders and those who have walked the longest, who have, have walked many years um, in their wisdoms. <clears throat> I'm thinking specifically about how the colonial project, for a number of reasons, has essentially convinced as many human people as possible to turn our backs on the land. We've been convinced that the land is dirty in a bad way, that it's a grunt labor to be close to the land, that it's a lesser than intelligence or knowledge to be close to the land. 
um, for indigenous peoples being referred to as heathens or as savages, that there is something associated with evil to be close to the land, to be in the woods or to be close to a wetland, um, which is very, very far, obviously, from an indigenous worldview. When we talk about re right relations, this is the work we're trying to unpack. If we have our backs on the land, we won't notice the deforestation. If we have our backs on the land, we won't no notice that the land has been turned to Swiss cheese by fracking and drilling and mining. If we have our backs turned to the land, we won't notice that as far as the eye can see is just a monocrop that is so intensely dependent on petrochemicals and is poisoning, again, the air and the water in our bodies and our food system. If we have our backs to the land, we won't recognize that the violence on the land itself is mirrored on the violence on our own bodies. And I just want to recognize the work, especially of Two-Spirit Community in Toronto for decades now, to talk about how the violence on the land is the violence on our bodies. The report on the inquiry into missing, murdered Indigenous women, girls, Two-Spirit people, indig queer, Indigenous trans peoples, very clearly states, actually, that that violence that's happening to human people who carry the Divine Feminine is an echo of the violence on the of the Divine Feminine everywhere we look. So think about the dairy cows and how they've been occupied and taken over. Think about egg-laying chickens. Think about even the manufactured landscapes of parks, which female, so-called female trees have been selected out of the landscape as being seen as messy. Among the things that we can decolonize from our hearts and our minds and restory, to be standing in the space of sisters um, is a very intentional, is a very intentional ceremony to, to bring these relatives here. I'm standing in front of a plant relative that's more recently, because of the popular, growing popularity around again, honeybees and pollinators. And I, I say honeybees and monarchs because they've, they've been given some majesty more recently, but every pollinator is important, including spiders, again, including the black fly. Um, bee balm as a, a cultivated variety of bergamot. So this crimson flower, which we've come to know as bee balm, generally is covered in pollinators. Uh, of course, we've kind of displaced them by being here. In this side of the mound is wild bergamot, which is a lavender shade of purple and is the, is the wild growing bergamot. Um, to say, I know in Okwewina it's referred to as Yedongwanostakwa or Zanzibar in Anishinaabe Moen. Uh, it's also referred to as Monarda. And I say all those names just to suggest when plants have many names, it speaks to how potent they are. So, classic British move get the black tea from India, get the bergamot from the Americas, put them together, call them Earl Grey, and make it sound like it's theirs. Just gonna take a moment on that. To say uh, bergamot is a next level plant of medicine. We put it in the center of the circle, in the center of the sisters, because obviously the pollinators will come to it, which means as they fly in and out to check this plant out, which is very attractive, they also better pollinate all the other sisters that are here. So it's a design, it's a design choice, but it's also traditional knowledge, uh, just as the mounds themselves are. So for mound building people, um, there's technical aspects that are really significant about why we grow these sisters in a mound. Uh, for one, we concentrate the nutrients. So traditionally we would plant fish, today we use fish emulsion, and amongst the things, compost and compost tea. Though I could really geek out on that, but I, I won't go there right now. Um, it's about concentrating fertility rather than just spraying uh, fertilizer all over the place, including in between plants. We just concentrate the fertility. This is a compost pile. It's also a home for these sisters. The idea is once you build the mounds, you never disrupt them. You never step on them. And mound building people understand that a mound is not to be stepped on, but in very specific times for ceremony. So it means they'll never be compacted. They'll never deal with what our agricultural or industrial fields look like with those heavy machines going over them all the time. So if you ever heard about the Dust Bowl era, um, the heavy compaction and of course lack of proper irrigation, the winds just blew the topsoil away. And there's a phenomena in ecological agriculture that is referred to as peak soil, which really ought to be more well known about than peak oil, because of course you can't eat oil, but without soil, even in hydroponic agriculture, you can't grow food. So the, the wisdom of the mound is actually infinite. Uh, and I could go, go on further, but just to say, the ecosystem of sisters includes that the mound itself is one of the sisters and one that to be respected and honored. So 
We recognize it this time of year, so it's early August. This is green corn ceremony. You can see on some of the, some of the stalks that the ears are just starting to set. And I'll come back around actually to show you some really beautiful stalks. Um, the ears are just starting to set and they're juicy. They're full of that milk. Um, we know that at this time of year, we need to reinvigorate our ceremony to let the sisters know we haven't forgotten because often, usually we're not getting so much rain. So we're doing a lot of water work. We're pulling out hoses and we're singing to the water. It's the time of year to put down all the work and just recognize what we have and know that even though we have stalks here, the ears aren't finished yet and the bean pods haven't dried yet. We don't have the seed. We don't have the guarantee or the promise for next year. And in that teaching is something about our seven generation teachings. And I'm going to bring that in because we talked, Jennifer talked about place making. And place making is so important wherein we're, we're on indigenous land. Indigenous people were all over this land. We know that. And yet, You'd be hard pressed to easily find connection to indigenous people, even in the Jane and Finch neighborhood. Lots of indigenous people, but there aren't, set, there aren't places to just find them. Uh, there's reasons for that, partly the, the uh, refrain from institutional spaces. <clears throat> but to say when, when we're acknowledging that making place for indigenous people today is not a simple thing and it has to do with a lot of uh, commitment and, str and struggle, but commitment to resiliency, commitment to continue to insist we deserve to be here in the face of any number of, and I, I, I know that you folks can do your work to understand what have been the impacts that have led to the phenomena of cultural genocide. It's so more than just having erased people, which actually happened, as I acknowledged in the Thanksgiving address, is the ongoing impediments, the ongoing barriers for Indigenous people to self-determine, to practice anything that allows them to connect to their indigeneity. Um, I bring that up because, again, in the face of climate change, there's a number of reasons why Indigenous people need to be supported. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak a little, bit, a little bit to that and give you the opportunity to do your own homework to dig into this. But um, on the planet, as is also the case in the nation state of Canada, or Ganada, which is an Indigenous word, um, Indigenous people actually only occupy, through the reserve systems, less than 2% on the planet of the land. In Canada, indigenous peoples through the reserve system are placed on less than 0.2%. Some would say it's actually less than 0.1%. There's some debate. I'll go with Arthur Manuel's, the late great Arthur Manuel, who says definitely not more than 0.1% of all the land in Canada. 0.01 held by indigenous peoples through the reserve system. And most of that land is not arable. It's marginal land. Not arable means you can't even grow the sisters there. You can't grow food there. It's so small as a postage stamp, it can't support a herd for our traditional foodways. Most of those lands are also surrounded by industry, mining and what have you, and so the peoples are poisoned from every direction. And yet, they hold over 85% of the biodiversity in Canada and on the planet. So whilst on the planet, again, it's less than, it's about 2% held by indigenous people, over 85% of the world's biodiversity is held by indigenous people. So the UN and their declarations, a number of, and a more recent declaration uh, on how to address climate change have said we must put indigenous people at the center of all of our actions, of all of our organizing. It's not just about consenting, getting one indigenous person to say, yeah, sure, go with that. And you give them some money, but rather you need circles of indigenous people, communities, and it must be diverse communities, elders, young people, single moms, racialized people, etc. Folks with different kind of lived experiences who can give their perspective on how to actually keep what little bit of biodiversity we have left. Because literally every day we lose hundreds, some say somewhere between 400 and 600 species a day. No big deal? I know it's an open question for you, but part of that loss of species or that species extinction is again about having been convinced that we should turn our backs on the land. We won't notice all that loss until it's kind of too late. So. Writing Relations is about remembering, restoring. We all come from the land, every single one of us. No matter where your ancestors come from, they came from the land. And they probably could never have imagined that we would find ourselves in a future where people forgot that our food sources, our medicine sources, are our relatives and that we're meant to be in a stewardship relationship with them day in and day out. That we are not meant to feel embarrassed to sing to them. That we aren't meant to feel ashamed to dance with them or for them. <clears throat> I'm wanting, to, uh, I'm wanting to actually just speak to one last piece while we're in here. And I'm gonna come, we're gonna come into the Western direction. We're gonna come to the Western direction where we recognize for people who practice uh, 
medicine well spiritual teachings, that the western direction where the sun sets, uh, where we put the medicines of night and of fall and of adulthood and parenthood and things like that. Um, this is also the doorway or the gate to the spirit world. So I'm thinking about in the fall how we have that, uh, still today, we in some ways celebrate what is called Halloween, uh, whether it's dressing up like a sexy pony or what have you. There's a tradition there for peoples all over the planet, which is a recognition that in that fall time, in that Western direction, the veil between our world, the physical world, and the spirit world, the metaphysical world, is very thin. And it's a time where we can connect to our ancestors, our helpers and our guides in a really, a really intentional way. So we know that whenever we come into the Western direction, we're meant to recognize, at least internally, that we are closest to our spirits. Uh, in this context, for me, I'm thinking on, again, how the beaver clan, I keep bringing up my, my beaver helper, has helped me literally to not walk off a cliff. More than and has been walking with my family for many generations. So it's an ancestor to me. And that's another opportunity for us to decolonize our hearts and our minds, to think on, to accept today the clan teachings and clan responsibilities as a community worker. I have to unpack any shame that thinking about beaver in that way as a relative is a problem. In fact, the more I open myself up to all these relations, the more medicines I'm able to walk with, the more gratitude I'm able to walk with in the face of so much grief. So I, I really want to point out on these corn stalks and these onesis stalks, uh, just the deep, deepness of color of red and purple and almost black actually on these stalks. Um, to me, that is a, such a beautiful thing to see. Um, I was talking before about how conventional corn and the choices for that, the genetic diversity of conventional corn has nothing to do actually with nutrition and in fact the more color there is in food the more nutritious it is so to me it's it's a beautiful thing to see these colors coming through on these stalks of corn and i think that as a metaphor it's actually very powerful to recognize um, what is a puritanical force of whitewashing our food from rice to literally bleaching wheat uh, not because it's better for us but it's simply because of food politics so there is a lot of restoring that happens just by seeing these, these corn here in terms of witnessing other ways of being. And <clears throat> for me, um, as a two-spirit person, I, I want to actually speak about a teaching that I received from corn and point out this ear of corn in particular. And that I would love to actually point out all kinds of things going on in these mounds, but this particular ear of corn that also is showing a lot of color um, it's in the green corn phase, so we won't know what the kernels will actually look like for a few more months. So we'll keep singing, we'll keep our ceremony strong so that these kernels can really manifest. But this particular cob, it both, or this particular stock, has wheat lakosh, which is a mushroom growing up in the tassels, which for peoples uh, in Mesoamerica, or Latinx peoples, uh, recognize that fungus as, as a blessing, actually, whereas settler colonial folks here and this part of the world in industrial agriculture see that as a pestilence. It's actually delicious. Uh, but I want to actually point out that on the, the very tip of this cob is a bit of what is actually a tassel. And I carry a two-spirit teaching that this cob is actually a two-spirit cob. And of course, corn, like many relatives, which are queer as shoot on the land, uh, the tassel is said to be the masculine energy of the corn, whereas the silks, which come out of the ear, the silks which capture or catch the pollen, every little barely visible pollen slides down the silk and lands in the belly button that becomes a kernel of corn. And that could be pollen that falls from the same plant or it can be pollen that falls from any one of its neighbors. Or if we were growing out in the monoculture lands, it could be corn that blew from three football fields away, which is why these corns actually can't grow just anywhere. Most of southwestern Ontario now looks like the prairies, even though it was once all wood wooded. So in order to find a place where these corns can grow safely without being contaminated by the wind pollinated, the pollen coming from GMO Roundup Ready corn, uh, is part of the reason why we're growing them here in the city. That the buildings in the cityscape actually provide a buffer for these sisters. So even though they struggle with the intensified humidity, which is within the greenhouse effect of a city because of all the concrete and the glass and the steel that heats it up all the more, they have a better chance of actually pollinating properly and getting good seed on a cob because otherwise I would have to put a bag on 
the tassel and on the silk and hand pollinate it. And I'm not wind, it's hard to make like wind, just saying. So there's an interesting thing about this urban garden, this urban agriculture is, is actually bit by bit in this tiny garden, restocking a very rare seed that is both culturally really significant. And again, when we practice with these sisters, they give us songs and ceremonies. That's why they are the site of biocultural knowledge, not us. They're the ones giving us through our ceremony, reclaiming from the land itself practices that have otherwise been lost because we haven't been allowed to talk about them. Uh, and that's another decolonial process. If I don't allow myself to believe that this relative can communicate to me, all that knowledge is lost. And of course, corn, which is a grass, and I'm gonna look around for some grass growing. Here's some. <clears throat> you need to collect a lot of those seed heads to make yourself a bowl of cereal. Corn, which is a, a grass like wheat, like rice, and of course, or even uh, barley, ancestors for hundreds, thousands of years in the origin, original places of those grasses also sang and danced for those grasses so that the seeds would become voluptuous enough that we might make a meal of them. But corn, even here, one kernel of corn can hold many seeds of rice or many seeds of barley or even of wheat, <clears throat> which is something to be said about how strong the ceremony was across the Americas for corn. And of course, the corn in the birthplace of this relative, which is Central America, is the size of a loony, which means it could fit several of our corn kernels inside of it. To speak of the generosity of this relative is, is a relationship you can build your whole life. And as a corny guy, I can tell you, you literally can build this relationship for your whole life. And I invite you to, to find one relative out there that's growing around you in the cracks in the back alley. Maybe it's a tree in your neighborhood. Maybe it's a rock that's around. One relative that isn't a human to have a relationship with, maybe a daily relationship, or even once a week, go and check in like you would another friend. And kids get this easily. They don't have any difficulty actually connecting to the spirit of a plant because they're closest to spirit. They're born with all their birthrights and all their gifts. And it's only as they're institutionalized that they grow to become more and more colonized and to be ashamed, to feel less and less free in how they move in their bodies. Um, but to say, when we talk about harvesting, as again, Josh was talking about, when we harvest laying down that sema to honorably harvest, when we approach a cedar tree, kids have no difficulty introducing themselves to that cedar tree and letting that cedar tree know why we want to harvest it and asking permission from that cedar tree. And most importantly, listening to the cedar tree to get consent before we harvest. And that's a tough one in the Western world, but we're restoring consent by writing relations in these practices. <clears throat> so the next time you eat corn, which could have been this morning, will surely be at some point today because we eat corn is in almost everything, that sacred relative. Just take a moment actually, if, just to honor in spirit what corn has done for you, what corn has done for your family, what corn does for the planet. <clears throat> Recognizing that, we're going to make our way out of the Western direction, take that opportunity to acknowledge the spirits, again, your ancestors, your helpers and your guides, whatever animals or plants, when you were a kid and you were closest to spirit and you felt on them, I imagine right now I'm thinking about myself as a child, I really felt on wolf and I really felt on horse and that I understood and I understand that those helpers were with me at that time to help me in my journey. <clears throat> And I'm very thankful for that. And likely if you take a moment, you'll remember that you had a number of helpers and guides when you were a child and still to this day. You probably still even have stones around in your home that you picked up in the past because they're still helping you. So I wanted to just give a little, just give a little teaching. Um, I spoke earlier about this Gidiganing or this garden as a site of biocultural knowledge. And, and I want to actually speak about I want to speak about frontline work and thinking about uh, land-based practices as an other frontline. And in fact, in some ways, as it specifically relates to decolonization and the simultaneous reindigenization, to say uh, decolonization in and of itself won't be effective if reindigenization isn't happening at the same time. So we each have our own work to do to unpack the roots of colonization for ourselves. Uh, and then there's that work to support indigenous community. Uh, as not just allies, more than that as accomplices to take direction and, and guidance and lead to have actual relationships with Indigenous people, which is more than just reading a book or listening to a panel or a podcast, but having relationships with Indigenous people. And of course, 
not just the easiest indigenous people, which includes myself. Uh, I'm, I'm one ripple among ripples that are coming in the waves of re-indigenization, which is to say at this time, because of the ways I've been colonized, I, I am more comfortable for people to listen to, including because I'm white coated, in, including because of masculinization as read in my body. And I acknowledge that accountably to be transparent and to recognize um, it is my work to, to help make place with community but more importantly, to assure that the roots, the foundational roots are here to keep place for those ripples, those waves that are coming, that must come, and which represents those peoples who would never even consider crossing the threshold that is the gate into the space. They wouldn't consider crossing, crossing the threshold into programs that have been labeled as for indigenous people because they know that the work hasn't happened yet to include them. And I mean, of course, our more racialized, again, uh, class accessing, there's any number of ways we have to think about social location and the ways in which those intersect in our experiences and give or exclude uh, our ability to access things or to feel included, to have a sense of belonging. And of course, re-indigenization is about reconnecting to the land and belonging is about having a sense of connection to the land. So I think about my community members, specifically those most marginalized and most pushed to the fringes who are racialized, two-spirit people, gender non-conforming, walking as how they self-identify, whether that's crip or mad or managing disabilities, how they self-determine, <clears throat> that they are most often the ones who are stigmatized because they are street involved or close to the street, they're shelter using. And from a Western perspective or a colonized perspective, we see that in a stereotypical way. And what I've learned by being in community, also being street involved myself, um, or with housing insecurity and jobbing insecurity, being close to the land also includes actually being street involved. That for many of my indigenous community members, using the shelter system is a way of being able to have ongoing freedom of movement, which is something that our ancestors had before borders and boundaries were put in place, before roads delineated for us where we were allowed to walk. It was a medicine work actually to just walk freely what we call wonder work, a kind of wonder work that is based on walking simply with the, the intent to be in a state of wonderment. But you can't do that today because anywhere you walk is, is mitigated by all these, these boundaries and these borders and parameters. Um, so to say, a kind of frontline work which is returning to the land, there's so much decolonizing to do to even allow ourselves to get our hands dirty, let alone to recognize that this work um, I chose to stand in front of these flowers, which have become more and more popularized again in terms of pollinator gardens. Um, and that's a, a kind of greenwash that comes from a neoliberal front. Let's just put in some Black Eyed Susans and some Echinacea, more common, more familiar, they're pretty. And so they've been domesticated. These are wild plants originally from these lands, Rudbeckia, coneflower, good medicine. Uh, few people know about the medicines actually that are inherent in the plants that are all over the land. Echinacea, hopefully you've heard about, it's good for building up your immune system, but I wanted to use this as an example. This creates a threshold that some people feel comfortable with and feel comfortable to be around. It looks a certain way, it reads a certain way in visual language. Uh, but if this, this bed was just full of these dandelions and these European thistles, we have a very different take. If it was just full of this plant that I found on the ground, pulled out by the root, uh, referred to as, among the things, pigweed, which suggests it's a, as a weed. People hear that word and right away, they th well, they might be thinking about marijuana, but mostly they're thinking about a plant that has been subjugated to a stigma. It's a pest. We want it out of there. Weed it. Get rid of it. Even though this plant, again, amongst the names, it's a goosefoot. It's also known as callaloo. It's also known as amaranth. And it's one of the most nutritious plants that grows all over these lands. It's an indigenous green. We refer to this one as a green amaranth. You can eat all parts of it. You can eat the leaves raw or cook them, put them in a sauce, just like you would spinach. You can cook the seeds like quinoa. You can grind the seeds and make flour. And it is, without a doubt, many times more nutritious than even organic spinach you might find in the grocery store. It's full of minerals. It's got an almost salty quality to it. So it's remineralizing, full of iron and the B12 vitamins <coughs> to say. By being referred to as a weed, and I think again on dandelion, which is a really good medicine. You can eat all parts of it. It's really good to cleanse your kidneys. These plants show up on the land, one, because animals, birds in particular, eat their seeds because they know how nutritious they are. 
But we have a teaching that plants show up where we need them, where we need actual nutrition to be healthier, where we need medicines to cleanse our kidneys because of how contaminated the water in our body is. But the idea of referring to these as weeds and thusly removing them from the land is an important metaphor. Because for folks who will want to, who we want to see into the future, cross the threshold to return to this cultural work, they relate more with these plants than this neatly manicured garden that only appeases certain people's eyes. And I want to speak to that because in order to understand what it is to actually re-indigenize and again to connect to indigenous people is to understand not just the burdens that they bear, which is surviving cultural genocide, having lost the connection to parents because of residential schools, who, parents who weren't allowed to touch their children or be touched by their own parents for that matter, thusly not learning how to parent in that way of tenderness and generosity that we had 100% as indigenous peoples. Uh, beyond the stereotypes or the statistics about suicide, about substance use, about mental health, but all of those things we need to consider as a whole to holistically understand what it is to recognize that people are again walking with grief and to work with community from a trauma-informed place of harm reduction which is to say uh, everyone is again born with their gifts and walking with their gifts and a really critical indigenous teaching that I feel to share is about self-determination. I, I said myself I self-determine as a Great Lakes Métis or as a Gitchigami Oshkemadzik. Indigenous people recognizing self-determination also then need to be honored through non-interference. This is a really important teaching. So in order for you and I and every one of us to self-determine, to allow our gifts to express themselves uniquely, no one else is going to express the gifts. And I am a monozygotic identical twin and my twin does not walk with the same gifts as me. I know that, even if we look similar. <clears throat> non-interference is about allowing people to express their gifts. It's actually fostering an environment of inclusion that allows people to express themselves. And that's a lot easier said than done, no doubt. And that is a future that we're hoping for if we really want to decolonize. And for you folks in the work that you're doing in your fields of study, but more specifically when you find yourselves in these different clinics or clinical environments, institutional environments, for sure those are frontline spaces. But for Indigenous people and for all the things and so much more that we could be speaking about here to support Indigenous people so that they don't continue to contribute to statistics about being 7 to 30 times more likely to walk out of their bodies, to be a part of a future that maintains and hopefully grows biodiversity, not just biodiversity of plants, but biodiversity of life in the soil, biodiversity of animals, and of course, biodiversity of human thought and exchange, that nation to nation work that enables us to imagine that all the decisions that impact us today here and all over the planet are not just being made at the, that same boardroom table by those white, same, the same white cis heterosexual men with the same interests who are never gonna come up with new solutions, really. We need to wonder on actually the teaching of the circle, which is one of the oldest technologies in the sort of toolkit of indigenous people. The circle, we're all equal. Everyone has a place. Everyone's gifts are meant to be welcomed into the center of the circle and really important just like that honorable harvest and that piece about consent is to wonder on what what isn't there who isn't there what relatives aren't there and how do we actually build a consensual relationship so that they feel comfortable enough to cross the threshold into our circle and the same teaching about those ripples we want the circle to grow i want the circle to grow that's why i recognize i'm just one little ripple among ripples that are coming in a red tide that's rising so I just want to restore this weed that is actually one of the best foods and medicines on this land, just like the significance of that corn, just like the significance of the indigenous community at Jane and Finch. The more we develop relationships with these and allow ourselves to take those, those colonial thoughts, and put them aside even just for a moment, just to breathe in, to witness this relative as it is, so much can we learn about that. And to say, as I lay this so-called weed back on the ground, that weed, like any other relative treated as a weed, is at the front line of your work. So again, practicing that Eastern Direction teaching, coming from the East, walking into what is the medicine garden uh, that Josh recollect, you've had the blessing of meeting. Uh, first set these roots and these seeds in here. Uh, this garden is also referred to as the welcome garden. So as we've been talking about that sema or that oyengwa omwe, that tobacco that 
in this case is in the eastern direction holding all the teachings and all the medicines of the eastern direction. It's already been harvested a few times by the looks of it here, which is beautiful. Um, to say we have an understanding that tobacco is direct connection to creation spirit. So one of the reasons why it's so honoring when we harvest to lay that tobacco is because it, it is it is literally giving a spirit connection to that plant. So in terms of harvesting some strawberry, it would be the same difference. That odimin that's growing here all around this medicine garden. Uh, when I lay tobacco, I'm letting the plant know that I, that I respect it, that I'm thankful for it, that I wish for it to be here tomorrow and for seven generations to come to make sure that the great, 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 great grandchildren get to enjoy this strawberry. And we believe deeply, and I'm holding tobacco in this tie, that tobacco has the possibility, it's a time traveler, that it can go with tobacco in hand, it can connect to our, with our spirit, to our ancestors in the past, to the coming ones in the future, we can go up into the sky world, we can go into the center of the earth, that tobacco is a kind of time traveling medicine, uh, but again, most importantly, it is the most honoring medicine. There are other teachings that you could lay from your some of your hair, which we consider our spirit tether, even an eyelash or any other medicine. The important thing is that it's intentional, that whatever you're laying down to honor that harvest is intentional to maintain that regenerative reciprocity, to make sure that, again, our relatives today and tomorrow get to enjoy these medicines. So, so much more that can be said about tobacco and its powerful healing properties, especially trying to, again, decolonize and re-indigenize this plant medicine, which obviously in its manufacturing of cigarettes is a powerful medicine. Um, wanting to reclaim the origins of the peace pipe or spike, smoking tobacco as a, as a means of connecting spirit to spirit when you share your pipe uh, and calling in vision quests. But as we come into the southern direction, in this iteration of the medicine wheel, um, cedar is put in the southern direction. And I was saying earlier, different colors get associated and sometimes the medicines get put in different places. Um, these are based on Josh Recollect's teachings and the teachings he received from his mother, Vivian Recollect. Um, much respect to the, their family. So in the southern direction, where the teachings of like summer and youth and fire, all that kind of momentum, that heat energy, it's actually really, to me, powerful to have cedar here. Cedar here is a spirit protector, is a medicine that's used. Uh, as, a, as a tea or a wash when babies are born and when people are crossing into the spirit world, they're bathed in that cedar water again. When we drink cedar tea, it's very cleansing. Of course, we put cedar, we're taught to put cedar around our sacred fires or over our doorways as protectors of those spiritual portal, portals or spiritual uh, thresholds. <clears throat> Coming into our western direction and again wanting to honor that this is the direction that we connect with the spirit. Always want to honor that. We've got a variety of prairie sage. Um, most folks who know about smudge and smudge medicine are more familiar with white buffalo sage. It holds a great smoke. Uh, it's not indigenous to these lands. It comes from south of the medicine line. Uh, generally speaking, the roots don't survive the winter here. So it's really beautiful to see a variety of prairie sage. We're trying to restore the prairie sages on these lands. They also hold a beautiful smoke. Um, the idea being that we would burn all leaf parts and of course the flower and seed heads and they produce as, as potent a smudge smoke as the white buffalo. Um, in this case, thinking about the prairie sage <clears throat> as a medicine that doesn't just come from the prairies but grows abundantly in the prairies, but it, it did and does still grow on these lands. I've seen it growing on the sand dunes of Georgian Bay and of course along the Humber River as well. So. It's doing really well here. <laughs> Soon it will be harvested, or it could be harvested again down to its lower nodes of leaves and new growth will come out. And that's true of all, all of these plants actually. When you harvest it, more comes out. Two of the sweetgrass. So as we come into the northern direction, we've got our Wingosh sweetgrass here. So to say in Anishinaabe Moen, Sema, Asema, Geshek, Mashkodejabik. And Wingashk, these four medicines. Um, sweetgrass, I've heard referred to as the hair of Mother Earth, but also as a as a feminine medicine. Um, that it it is very healing. It is a very gentle kind of medicine. 
Um, and I've also heard a teaching that it's because it's a women's medicine, it's really important for men to work with sweetgrass so that they can maintain uh, something which they're born with, which is gentility, to, to continue to be gentle people and to walk gently on the earth. Um, it can be used in a tea. It, of course, can be braided into, <coughs> it can be bra braided and then used by burning as a smudge. Um, it is a plant medicine that tends to grow close to water. And so in that way, too, it is associated with um, the feminine and the feminine properties of water and emotions. And, and I'm just naming that to reclaim, of course, in the context of colonization, specifically patriarchy, which has often stigmatized emotions and feelings, those senses as being feminine, thusly somehow not uh, valuable. It's a, a process for us to to actually re-feminize ourselves and to reconnect with our emotions. Um, I think on a Nehe Akri teaching, which is that crying is a ceremony and it's a gift from our bodies to cry, to help us to let go of, of feelings that will, if repressed, be harmful to us and more often than not end out coming out in uh, projective ways and being harmful to other people. So there are many different ways of honoring our crying ceremony. The first thing is to believe that we deserve to have a crying ceremony to experience it. And I really honor in my own lived experience how powerful sweetgrass is, even in its subtle, gentle medicines in helping us to connect to those senses, to connect to our emotionality and including our intuition. <clears throat> so I just want to I just want to point out that when folks come to Black Creek Farm, just here coming from the northwest, it's the parking lot, and this is the entryway into the welcome garden. And so the effort, and again, recognizing Josh Recollect, the effort to put these medicines in here as a way of welcoming people to the farm is a really important nation to nation uh, gesture of reconciliation, not just to let us have our medicines here, but to share with anyone and everyone who comes into this space the power of these medicines, whether or not we harvest them. Just by their being here, we're actually receiving medicine from them. And there is really important transformative work that happens that they're doing across the whole land just wanting to create the opportunity to see this through line between this medicine garden and the medicine wheel garden with the sisters and seeing this effort circles within circles or ripples and ripples of re-indigenizing work that's happening here and community building that's happening here and hopefully if you hold this in your mind's eye with me in your and in your heart space we'll see more of these circles here at Black Creek Community Farm and ideally land back in every green space in this city. Marce, miigwech, everybody who has joined us here today. Uh, it has been a real joy to share this land, our relationships, our connections, uh, and, um, and our vision of placemaking, of creating spaces for Indigenous voices, for creating spaces for us to connect to all of our relatives. Um, and so we're about to draw to a close. No, wanting to share with you um, a song that is in and of itself a ceremony. And we often, we usually come together in song as a way of landing here together, as a way of sort of calling in our ancestral and spiritual ties. We sing to the sisters, we sing to the earth when we're working. Uh, and it, this is going to be like a traveling song. So to wish you all well as you go your way uh, in the digital realm or in the virtual realm. Um, but also uh, it's a way of wishing you well and wishing your helpers and your guides well and your ancestors well and the descending, AKA the coming faces, wishing them well too. Um, the song we're going to share is the Wendat Healing Song. Uh, it was shared with me uh, by my elder, Catherine Tamaro, who is a seated faith keeper of the Wyandotte of Anderden. Um, and it is known to be the only surviving Wendat song. Uh, and it's sung now well into the Wyandotte nations uh, south of the Medicine Line and of course at Wendage uh, in different interpretations. Um, it is known as a healing song because it helped the people survive being walked from these lands, AKA being dispersed from these lands. So uh, the Wendat peoples walk their own trail of tears uh, for some of them all the way down into Oklahoma. And so it's a healing song 
in that it helped them tend to their grief. And we're gonna share that song both as a way of recognizing that we walk with grief. It's a part of uh, being alive today. Um, and also as a form of land acknowledgement again for those Wendat peoples to restory them. And uh, we're gonna sing it in seven rounds for all the directions, the four cardinal directions, above, below, and then that internal within direction. Yep. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Make what? 